Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ann Nelson, and I am a research scholar at the Arnold Saltzman Institute for War and Peace Studies, which is the place to be, in my opinion. Uh, and I'm very happy to see that our new director here uh, in the audience, Peter Clements, uh, who's doing already a wonderful job. Um, so this afternoon, as you all know, we'll be hearing about Jack Saltzman's new book. Jack. Jack. <laughs> ah, no. You I love this. I love the Institute. Yes, I love it. Jack Snyder's new book, and it is called Human Rights for Pragmatists, Social Power in Modern Times. And all of us who know and love Jack know that he can really interrogate a question like nobody's business, and that's what he's done in this book. He's taken a body of work that's been going on really since the end of the Second World War and raised new questions about it. I believe seeking the same goals as the human rights community, but also asking what the best avenues to reach those goals might be. And this book is so spectacular that it's sold out. But there will be someone in the back who will allow you to order one at a very special price uh, which I encourage you all to do, uh, because it's a very intense and compelling read. So today, uh, I will be moderating, and uh, this panel feels a little autobiographical to me, because as a very, very young person, I had the honor of working with Arie Nair at Human Rights Watch, before it was called Human Rights Watch, and watch the formation of this extraordinary community and body of ideas largely shaped by his, his, his leadership. And then uh, long ago, I came to Columbia, and early on I met Jack Snyder and had an ongoing conversation with this interrogation he had of press freedom, human rights, and other areas of, of consideration. So this will be... Uh, an extraordinary conversation between two people who share the goals but believe that different roads can lead to Rome. Uh, in terms of the backgrounds of the panelists, as I said, I worked at Human Rights Watch uh, for several years, then became the director of the Committee to Protect Journalists, and worked on freedom of expression uh, questions for, for some years, and then came to Columbia in 1995, first at the Journalism School and then here at SEPA where I've worked in areas of media analysis, so freedom of expression is a central part of this debate. Arie Nair uh, here was the executive director of the ACLU for a number of years, where he dealt with very, very compelling issues that were also very contentious about freedom of expression in the United States. He was the founding director of what became Human Rights Watch and was the executive director for a number of years. He then went on to the Open Societies Foundations, uh, which were founded by George Soros, where he was president. And he still remains very involved in, in human rights matters and, and policy. Uh, after REA speaks, who will follow Jack's introduction to his book, uh, we'll hear from Shari Berman, and she is an authority on the historical rise and significance of social democracy in Europe. And uh, her book, Democracy and Dictatorship in Europe, <laughs> has been very influential in this debate, as well as uh, a series of comments in the Journal of Democracy, which features in Jack's book. And then we'll finally hear from Alex Cooley, author of Exit from Hegemony, the most cited book on authoritarian pushback against the liberal international order, and also the co-editor with Jack of Ranking the World, which was a very interesting exercise that examined the way human rights organizations and others created scorecards for governments and nations uh, trying to come up with rankings uh, with varying success. So without further ado, uh, Jack, can you start? Well, thanks so much, and and thank you so much to everybody on this panel. Literally, uh, they all left uh, a big imprint on this book over the course of quite a number of years. In fact, thanks are due to the audience, both uh, on the web and in the room, because there are a lot of people in the audience that also made a big impact uh, on this book, for which I'm grateful. Uh, and I'm also very grateful for Ingrid Gersman and the Saltzman staff for uh, setting this uh, up. 
a kind of complicated business uh, to organize. So pragmatism and human rights, kind of like oil and water. I uh, recruited an undergraduate and told her that I wanted her to be a research assistant on my book on human rights for pragmatists. And her brow furrowed, and she was completely per perplexed. And she said, but Professor Snyder, human rights are by definition purely idealistic. And uh, I explained to her, uh, Ought implies can, <laughs> and she got it, and she did fabulous research uh, on the book. Uh, the other person who's recently been widely discussed with uh, his views on pragmatism is Barack Obama in his 30-year-old never-published book manuscript, <laughs> which starts off with a diatribe against uh, what he called the rudderless pragmatism of uh, American uh, liberal conventional wisdoms of that era. Uh, and, but his critique goes on to complain that these pragmatists failed to organize a powerful majority coalition to uh, even stay in power, let alone advance uh, progressive uh, goals. And so he, what Obama is for in that manuscript is a principled approach that pays attention to the tactics of gaining power, which is exactly what I'm talking about in my book on human rights for pragmatists, where uh, I treat human rights as a set of aspirational goals that are laid out you know, by Thomas Jefferson, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the founders of Human Rights Watch. Uh, and um, the way uh, my editor uh, put it was that uh, these aspirational goals set the compass for the direction that you want to go in, but they don't tell you exactly in the forest which way to go to avoid getting tangled up in, in the trees. So, uh, you know, how to maneuver on the path to that goal is what I'm addressing in the book. My critique is that there's been too much legalism, moralism, universalism, uh, shaming the shameless, and reluctance to make necessary tactical uh, expedient compromises. Though I admit that sometimes those ways of moving forward are necessary. I think they've been uh, too prominent in human rights people's thinking about tactics. And we should have more attention to the self-interest of powerful actors, uh, the need to win over fence sitters with inducements, the need to be expedient in tactics to isolate powerful spoilers so they can't derail the enterprise. Uh, and we also need to pay like relentless attention to remembering to persuade people in their own normative vernacular rather than in the langu language of the global human rights experts. Uh, another related lapse that I come back to time and again in the book is the failure to acknowledge the uh, usually necessary role of mass social movements. Uh, not just uh, a small hardcore of uncompromising uh, idealists, but mass movements were uh, crucial to the anti-slavery movement's success, Gandhi's success, Martin Luther King's success, um, usually coordinating with a pragmatic, opportunistic reform party that wants above all to govern. 
And that um, this is um, something that we need to remember now at a period of time where human rights ideas have spread all over the world, but it's hard to find a really sustained mass movement uh, that is successfully confronting the backlash against uh, liberalism, it's, uh, the backlash that's so prominent today and that Alex's book talks about. Um, so this is a battle that human rights advocates must win because so far liberal human rights based uh, models of modernity uh, are the only ones that we have that have shown the ability to produce sustained prosperity, social stability, and peace. The illiberal alternative models of modernity are, even as we speak, repeating all the past mistakes uh, that illiberal models have in, in the past. So the book sets the arc of human rights development in the context of social modernization, how human rights over decades and centuries built up positions of strength, uh, sometimes in the proper sequence and uh, sometimes not. Um, and it traces out implications of what we learn from that um, in such areas as transitional justice, media freedom, mass campaigns against corruption, and the sometimes quite toxic consequences of shaming tactics uh, and more. So back to you and, and the panel. Thank you. Great. Um, you're, you're reminding me of when I was first recruited to come to Columbia and the dean of the journalism school said, took me aside after I gave a talk and said, it, you are your background in the human rights movement and it's my thesis that that has now replaced religion in our society. And I said, uh, okay. Um, so we will move on to Arya Nair, who really is uh, in so many ways the intellectual architect of so much of our human rights thinking today and deserves special recognition for mentoring so many people who are leading the field. Uh, so on to Arya. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first, uh, I've been um, criticized uh, in uh, quite a lot of books, and I am criticized uh, in Jack Snyder's book, but I've never been criticized uh, so graciously as I am uh, in, uh, in Jack Snyder's book, and I want to uh, express thanks uh, to you for, uh, for that. Um, ha having said that, um, uh, a... Um, a basic argument of, of Jack's book is that uh, the naming and shaming, which has been the, uh, the foremost strategy uh, of uh, the um, international human rights movement, uh, is deficient, uh, that it inspires a backlash, uh, that it needs to be um, replaced uh, by... Um, more pragmatic uh, approaches to, uh, to human rights. Uh, and um, I'm a uh, strong partisan of, of naming and shaming. Uh, I consider it the essential tool uh, for the, uh, the international human rights movement. I'm not all that enthusiastic about the, uh, the term naming and shaming. Uh, it it uh, has acquired currency because uh, of the rhyme. Uh, it, it is quite uh, as um, uh, catchy, but uh, I think uh, documenting and denouncing uh, might be a uh, better term than, uh, than naming and shaming. Um, to me, it is uh, inconceivable uh, that the, uh, the international human rights movement uh, would um, desist from documenting and denouncing, uh, or that it would in any way uh, reduce its uh, reliance on that. And let me um, uh, 
uh, start by giving you a very capsule uh, history of the, uh, the international human rights movement. Um, it really came into existence in the 1970s. Um, uh, there was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, after World War II uh, adopted by the United Nations, but there was not really a movement that um, uh, emerged from the adoption of the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And Amnesty International was uh, founded in 1961, uh, but in its early years it focused on um, trying to provide protection for individual um, prisoners of conscience, and it didn't engage in the broad documentation of human rights abuses that the um, contemporary movement uh, engages in. Um, but uh, there were uh, events in uh, three widely separated parts of the world uh, in the 1970s that really um, sparked the, uh, the formation uh, of the, uh, the contemporary human rights movement. Uh, these were events uh, in Chile, uh, in South Africa, and in the, uh, the Soviet Union. In Chile, it was Pinochet's coup in 1973 that overthrew a democratically ele elected leftist uh, government uh, the involvement of the United States, of Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, uh, contributed to, uh, to Pinochet's coup, and that was part of what uh, made it an event of uh, great international significance. Uh, in South Africa, uh, there had been concern internationally with apartheid basically since the um, uh, 1960 Sharpeville massacre, uh, but in the mid-1970s, uh, there was the um, uprising in Soweto, Soweto uh, and there was the, uh, uh, the murder of Steve Biko, uh, and they really riveted attention uh, on uh, South Africa. And in the, uh, the Soviet Union, um, uh, a decade or, or, or two decades um, after the, uh, the death of Stalin, um, a, uh, a human rights movement uh, began to, uh, to emerge. Uh, the foremost figure uh, in the, uh, the human rights movement in the Soviet Union was the, uh, the physicist uh, Andrei Sakharov. Uh, he was awarded the uh, Nobel Peace Prize uh, in 1975. He couldn't actually go to Oslo to receive the uh, prize. He wasn't allowed to travel. His wife uh, Elena Bana did go uh, to, uh, to Oslo, uh, but at the time uh, that the uh, prize was being given, um, Sakharov was in Vilnius in Lithuania trying to get into the courtroom where one of his colleagues in the human rights effort, uh, the microbiologist uh, 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 Sergei Kovalyov, uh, was uh, put on trial. Sakharov didn't succeed in, in getting into the courtroom, uh, but he attracted some attention to what was going on, limited attention, because the reason the Soviets uh, held the trial in Vilnius uh, was that the visas for foreign journalists uh, didn't allow them to travel to the Baltic states, uh, which were still part of the, um, uh, the Soviet Union. And each of these things, uh, the, the role of Sakharov, the uh, Pinochet coup, uh, the death of Steve Biko, uh, aroused an immense amount of international attention. And efforts uh, developed in different parts of the world uh, to protest um, these uh, events. And most of the um, uh, human rights organizations that formed in the United States uh, in fact, uh, all those that became significant um, formed in the immediate aftermath uh, of uh, these events. In the, uh, the late 1970s, uh, where the origins of Human Rights Watch took place, the Washington Office on Latin America uh, came into existence because of the uh, Pinochet coup uh, in, um, in Chile, the 
what was called the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, which is Human Rights First today, uh, came into existence in that period. The Committee to Protect Journalists um, uh, came into existence, uh, Physicians for, for Human Rights. The Human Rights Movement um, uh, came into existence because of uh, these uh, events in other parts of the world. And um, the human rights movement um, denounced uh, the, uh, the abuses. Uh, it found that um, uh, its way of doing so was to um, investigate uh, the abuses, uh, document uh, what had happened, and then uh, try its best to call attention to those abuses, and in that way uh, put pressure uh, on the, uh, the governments that had engaged in those abuses. And uh, in fact, uh, with the three countries uh, which had been the initial focus uh, of the, uh, the human rights movement, that was effective. Uh, that is, uh, it took um, uh, a decade and a half until Pinochet uh, lost a plebiscite that he had um, uh, called for himself in order to extend his rule for another eight years, but he did lose the plebiscite, and that brought an end uh, to the Pinochet regime uh, in Chile. Uh, as far as South Africa was concerned, um, uh, it became uh, a big issue, particularly on college campuses uh, in the United States and in uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, college students um, wanted their universities to boycott uh, firms uh, that were engaged in business uh, in uh, South Africa. And uh, they pushed for uh, American sanctions against uh, South Africa. And Ronald Reagan vetoed the uh, legislation for uh, sanctions against South Africa. And then the Congress passed the um, legislation over Ronald Reagan's veto. And that helped to, uh, to bring about uh, the, uh, the time in uh, February 1990 uh, when the, uh, the South African apartheid government um, uh, released Nelson Mandela uh, from prison, uh, legalized uh, organizations like the African National Congress, and said there would be elections in which uh, persons from all races would be able to vote, in effect ending uh, apartheid uh, in South Africa. And as far as the Soviet Union was concerned, human rights movements uh, developed uh, not only in the Soviet Union itself, uh, but in the various satellite countries in the Eastern European uh, countries um, uh, the, the development of a human rights movement in Poland uh, was uh, especially significant. Um, it was manifested by the Solidarity Movement. The Polish government tried to crush the Solidarity Movement. Uh, underground Solidarity became an immense force. Uh, among other things, it published more than 400 underground newspapers uh, during the, um, the period that martial law was in effect. Uh, in Poland. And uh, all that uh, led to the um, uh, rise of Mikhail Gorbachev, who became um, the, the Communist Party secretary uh, in uh, 1985, uh, a decade after Sakharov had received the um, Nobel Peace Prize. And Gorbachev signaled the end to Soviet repression uh, the year after he became the Communist Party secretary by making a phone call to Andrei Sakharov in the city of Gorky to which he had been uh, exiled and allowing him to uh, return uh, to Moscow and to uh, resume his work. And among other things, uh, the, um, the advent of Mikhail Gorbachev uh, also brought an end to the, uh, the Cold War. So in each of these cases, uh, it took a while, um, but uh, the human rights movement um, achieved immense uh, successes uh, in uh, Chile, in South Africa, uh, in the, um, uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, obviously, things have gone bad uh, in Russia, uh, 
uh, we didn't anticipate that a Vladimir Putin uh, would come along. Uh, that reflects um, uh, hundreds of years uh, of repression uh, in Russia and 70 years of repression by the, uh, the Soviet, uh, by the Soviet Union uh, before uh, Gorbachev um, was able to take significant steps against uh, repression. Uh, one doesn't necessarily, uh, in, uh, uh, in one president or one uh, leader of the country, uh, one isn't necessarily able to reform the, uh, uh, the entire system, but it was a significant uh, uh, step that brought Gorbachev to, um, to office, and it wouldn't have happened without the human rights movement within the Soviet Union, within the Soviet bloc, and the human rights movement uh, worldwide. Now, um, there, there are many battles to be fought, um, and they're not going to be battles that can be um, won uh, in a short period of time. And there are different factors that uh, enter into the situation. Um, but the human rights movement's contribution has been that it has uh, increasingly professionalized. It has become um, more widespread uh, than it ever was before of citizen movements uh, worldwide. Uh, only the um, environmental movement uh, compares to the international human rights movement in the state of its organization on a worldwide basis. I mean, the other uh, significant popular movements are uh, the, uh, the women's movement and the gay liberation movement, uh, but those have never become as professionalized and as organized uh, as the environmental movement and as the, um, uh, the international human rights movement. And the international human rights movement um, knows its own limitations, uh, but it also knows its own strengths. And its strengths were reflected in uh, what it achieved in the countries that became the, uh, the first targets of its work. There are other ways of promoting uh, human rights. Uh, if you can you know, find a Gorbachev and uh, help him to, uh, uh, to achieve uh, authority, uh, that's a wonderful thing to do. It isn't something that outsiders uh, can usually do uh, in any part of the world. Uh, one can provide uh, financial assistance, one can provide um, uh, other forms of aid, uh, one can try to form alliances with groups uh, within the country, but documentation and uh, denunciation are the, uh, the principal tools of the uh, human rights movement, and uh, the human rights movement is not about to give away uh, its principal tools. Thank you. Thank you, Aria. Uh, Sherry Berman. Um, okay, so um, I'm not a human rights specialist. Uh, I'm a comparativist interested in, um, sorry, in political development, in how and why democracy develops, how and why political parties and ideologies succeed or fail. Um, but Jack's book resonated with me partially because it actually reflects what we know more generally about what makes social movements more or less powerful. Um, in a nutshell, how I read this very, this excellent book is that it's not merely the characteristics of movements that matter. Um, the morality or worthiness of the cause, the commitment, or as we just heard, perhaps the professionalization of their activists, right? As Jack puts it in this book, being on the right side of history, having moral principles at your back is not enough. Equally or perhaps more important in determining whether or not different social and political movements succeed um, is the context within, within which they find themselves. And there's lots of examples in Jack's book, if you want to be a little depressed at first and then hopeful at the end, of many worthy causes and worthy organizations, committed activists and organizations um, that fail to achieve their goals because they simply don't either understand the contexts that they're operating in, or more generally, and this is what I take to be the main argument of the book, don't understand that the contexts that they're operating in are not ripe or ready 
for the types of interventions or changes that they advocate. Um, I can't resist but take a step back, for instance, um, to the Gorbachev example. I love to do this with students in my class. Gorbachev was important, but if he had been born decades earlier and tried to impact the development of the Soviet Union in the 50s or 60s, he would have been a nobody because the context was not right for the kinds of reforms that he was pushing, right? That's the crucial aspect of context. It's not what you advocate. It's not your personal characteristics. It's whether or not those things fit into the context that you find yourself in. Um, by ripe or ready, what I took Jack's book to mean um, was that for human rights to take hold, for them, absolutely, for, for them to be able to change the lives of human beings over the long term, they must be um, advocated within a context within which these ideas can resonate. They can gain the support, as Jack said, of a broad coalition within society, and they can become embedded in institutions capable of promoting and enforcing human rights over time. So what kind of contexts are those? Well, um, when I read this, I couldn't decide if Jack's answer to this would make me optimistic or pessimistic. And let me tell you why. Um, to oversimplify a little bit, Jack's argument is a version of modernization theory in the sense that he argues that it's only in modern contexts, that is to say in societies that are fairly economically developed and democratic, that we are going to see human rights ideas resonate broadly gain the support of a broad and powerful coalition, and where institutions capable of promoting and enforcing them can develop, right? Also following classic modernization theory, Jack argues that economic development is salutary because it breaks down traditional social relationships, <laughs> status hierarchies, the kinds of things that threaten or do not fit obviously well with the individualistic nature of human rights. Economic development also enlarges and empowers the middle and working classes, which Jack says are the most likely candidates for that coalition um, that supports human rights. Also, of course, economic development breaks down the old elite. That is an old elite that benefits from the persistence of favoritism, status hierarchies, all those things that obviously do not um, comport well with human rights. Um, also following modernization theory and more particularly recent analyses of the relationships between economic and political development that we've seen over the past decades, Jack argues that economic development tends to push countries into the democratic camp. He notes, for instance, that no country has ever gone past the middle income barrier without adopting at least some, more than some generally, liberal rights. Jack explicitly argues that democracy is necessary, but not sufficient for human rights. Indeed, he says this is almost a tautology since any country that enacts the full panoply of human rights is by definition a liberal democracy, right? Now, the connection here is, is varied, and I'll leave you to read the book for, to get more um, information about the connections here, but most obviously, dictatorships have little interest in promoting or enforcing rights that limit their repressive, unresponsive, unrepresentative nature. You might get bits and pieces here and there, but if you really want human rights, right, that are broad, right, and that are enforceable, you're just simply not going to get that in dictatorships. So once you have an economically developed, relatively democratic society that is also at peace, right, that's a key part of the puzzle too, you have the necessary, but again, not the sufficient conditions for the acceptance, promotion, enforcement of human rights. So um, this brings me back to the optimism and the pessimism feelings that I had when I read this book. So um, the optimism part is obviously that as countries develop economically, they become wealthier, they become less traditional, they make transitions to something that resembles democracy, it's going to become easier and easier for human rights to gain acceptance and to be enforced. Um, but the pessimism part is obviously a lot of countries aren't anywhere near that stage, right? And the book spends a lot of time emphasizing the importance of sequencing, right? This is also a significant part of this pragmatism thing. It's a topic that Jack and I have discussed before, right? Jack really argues very strongly in this book that fighting for human rights before the correct 
economic, social, and political preconditions or contexts are in place means that these efforts are likely to fail or be very weak, right? He says many times in this book, there are no magic shortcuts. So then the question becomes, well, how much can outside actors, those committed activists and organizations, actually speed up those economic, social, and political conditions that will enable human rights to really flourish, right? Um, so here, Jack, I think, kind of hedges a little bit. And I'm wondering if maybe we would be able to talk more about this, right? Jack says that you can't choose the sequence, right? You got to kind of recognize that sequencing matters. But you can, he says, try to influence it at the margin. or Alternatively, focus attention on places where some of the preconditions exist rather than trying to implement policies or programs and contexts where they are really doomed to fail, right? Where the contexts are just not favorable. In this um, scenario, I read Jack as saying that the, um, the role of human rights activists and organizations is really to kind of finish off the project, right? To work in contexts where at least some of the conditions or contexts contextual factors necessary for human rights do, do exist, right? Um, but in order to gain, you know, sort of full acceptance and institutionalization, you really need the push of those people who are really committed to it, the activists, the organizations, right? To really make, to put the last pieces of the puzzle necessary. Maybe, in his view, the human rights organizations and activists are the sufficient to the necessary, right? There have to be some necessary things in place, but in order for these things to actually flourish and be institutionalized, you really need actors who are devoted to promoting them. Um, but again, there are a lot of countries that are nowhere near the gray zone that Jack suggests is really necessary. Um, and so this brings the, up the question of whether the pragmatism that is so prominent in the title and stressed throughout the book really means that promoting human rights in countries that are out of sequence, right, that are poor and undemocratic, means that you're kind of wasting efforts and there's you know, a limited amount of capital out there, right? Um, should human rights activists in those contexts turn away? Should they transform themselves perhaps into development specialists or democracy promoters since really over time I took him as saying that that actually would be more beneficial? Um, or what is the pragmatic solution to that particular dilemma? So I'll leave it there. Thank you. So I am really pleased and just, uh, just honored to be part of this panel, um, having seen a lot of these strands in Jack's research and career um, as separate projects, um, then linking now coming together in this you know this this one contribution it's it's truly special and the scope of the book really is stunning. Um, also seeing some really important arguments that have been formative in our field um, updated right and 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 given um, a new kind of uh, contemporary backing. I'm thinking about the work he did with Leslie Vinjamori on. Um, transitional justice uh, versus granting amnesties, sort of updated with uh, more evidence from many different conflicts. And I guess, you know, to me, some of the most also influential work on the relationship between the structure of media markets and conflict promotion, right? And I think, um, you know, those of us uh, who uh, were, were uh, around when, when Jack and Karen Ballantyne first put out this argument were, you know, deeply influenced by it. And I think the way he and Tamar uh, Mitz sort of uh, examined the Arab Spring and uh, the sort of proliferation of new media outlets and satellite media outlets, and they go from kind of central Al Jazeera that everyone watches and you have great integrated debates and public discourse to this world of, Hundreds of channels. Everyone's watching whatever they want to. Um, you know, the, the 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 public sphere falls apart with the predictable consequences that Jack's always warned us about. So these are both wonderful chapters. Um, I could engage with many things. The two issues, each of which, of course, I'm cheating, has subpoints. Um, I'd like to focus on are this uh, first this emphasis on um, anti-corruption. Anti-corruption work is being um, a complement or a vector for human rights advocates to grapple with. And uh, you know, over the years, Jack and I have talked a lot about anti 
corruption, especially on the transnational level. And I think the central premise is correct that anti-corruption um, does carry more kind of legitimacy, sometimes more moral authority than the human rights movements. And that's for a number of different reasons. I'm not saying that's right. Um, just saying it is more resonant in our geopolitical moment. However, uh, I think there are a number of specific thinking as a pragmatist about global advocacy on sort of anti-corruption, its relationship with human rights, number of challenges we need to grapple with, right? The first is just, you know, the, the kind of age-old values versus pragmatism debate that even raising corruption uh, is going to uh, <coughs> pose to us, right? When I'm thinking right now, what do we do about the UAE and Dubai becoming a center of uh, hiding oligarch assets and global money laundering? Uh, everyone knows that they're doing it, and yet we're reluctant to take uh, the step of designating them um, as uh, an inappropriate sort of financial entity, in part because of our alliance commitments and our geopolitical interests there. But there's also, I think, some more kind of complex relationships. The question of the growing heterogeneous liberal commitments that we have there. Uh, we mentioned sort of, you know, the kind of range of universal issues that have increasingly come on the agenda. Um, so on the one hand, adding anti-corruption to existing sort of baskets of issues that include human rights, um, the environment, LGBTQ, uh, gender equality, a lot of different important advocacy uh, causes creates more opportunity for wedge issues, but it also creates more opportunity for um, exploiting sort of tensions between different agendas. Let me give you an example. Um, last year, Amnesty UK uh, uh, took back the status, uh, rescinded the status of Alex Navalny, the famous anti-corruption crusader in mm -hmm. Russia, um, as a prisoner of conscience. Now, why did they do this? Uh, in part, they were responding um, to Navalny's statements, uh, quite racist, about uh, Central Asian migrants uh, that he had made uh, and a kind of, uh, kind of a, a Russia first nationalism to them. But he had made these in the middle of uh, the 2000s. And they were well documented, except that the Kremlin had launched a disinformation campaign exactly on this issue that, like Amnesty UK, fell right into. It was terribly embarrassing. They were forced to sort of rescind their original, <laughs> uh, uh, I don't even know what the correct word for that is. Um, and it all, you know, it all sort of opened up this possibility that you can sort of uh, uh, really uh, uh, hit, uh, hit hard against one types of rights by evoking another type of rights, right? And I think that's gonna be uh, uh, an issue. Third, even I think more important, is that we do have really good extraterritorial tools for anti-corruption, um, especially here with the FCPA and in the UK increasingly with unexplained wealth orders. But what research shows is that these are really politicized or uh, in danger of being politicized. And primarily they're used against exiles, right? And so the danger here is we have, you know, uh, this extraterritorial capacity and an authoritarian government comes knocking and saying, hey, we're just going to leave this anti-corruption file with you about all the really bad business activities that the lead supporter of the opposition has been engaging in. Um, do your thing, which there have been some signs of that actually uh, happening. Um, so, you know, again, it assumes kind of a politicization of the Justice Department and so forth, but we know unexplained world orders in the UK, they work against exiles and they don't work against existing regimes. Why? Um, because prosecutors have to rely on a body of evidence that comes from the Ministry of Justice of these authoritarian countries that's essentially asking them to provide information against their elites, which they're not going to do. So I think they're just some real practical challenges. Um, I'm all for, and I'm part of kind of the global anti-kleptocracy crew, um, but I think the relationship with human rights has some potential uh, challenges, if not landmines. Second, I want to engage Jack on the geopolitics of pragmatism. Um, I think he correctly states in the book, the most vital influence on human rights is the stability of the basic structures of the liberal international system. And we are indeed seeing um, you know, the real challenge of illiberalism. On the one hand, we've always had these challenges, and he does a wonderful job of, 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 of showing uh, 
um, in different eras how these have been confronted. But I wonder if this is less a pendulum and more a change in the ecosystem of a contemporary order that we need to pay special attention to. After all, part of what's prompted the backlash against uh, naming and shaming is the kind of designation of actors like Human Rights Watch um, uh, as uh, geopolitical actors intent on fomenting color revolutions, overthrowing governments, and promoting instability. And in fact, the color revolution has become a noun, right? That's used by you know, China, Russia, other governments to talk about this dynamic. Um, so the, the, the tarring of human rights advocates as geopolitical is already there. It's already being sort of deployed. And I'm wondering what can and should be done about that. I think the problem here is not only that Russia and China are introducing new kinds of ordering innovations, um, whether they're new counter norms and challenging liberalism, whether they're creating their own state media channels that alters this kind of global uh, media uh, ecosystem that we have, as well as the disinformation campaigns. Um, we have this asymmetric access, right? They have access to our media system. We don't have access to theirs anymore. Um, but even if you look at um, control and agenda setting in international organizations. We're just coming off the wake of a vote at the UN Human Rights uh, Council that basically voted down even opening an inquiry into what was happening in the re-education camps in Xinjiang. And incidentally, not only did China win that vote, Ukraine abstained, right? So geopolitics is part of this. So I guess all this leads me to sort of wonder, is a kind of open door policy that Jack is advocating for does this create a kind of a pragmatist dilemma, right? Which a coalition of the willing, play by our rules, adopt our norms, and you will develop the capacity, the performance, and ultimately the efficacious authority that liberal values are worth adopting. But that presumes that the liberal and the illiberal ordering spheres aren't affecting and mutually transforming each other. And that's my concern, that the liberal sphere where this action is possible gets whittled down and whittled down because we cede too much ground um, in the interest of sort of remaining, not being engaging in geopolitics. A quick example of this would be the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, right? An entity, China, Russia, the stands, it was joined by India and Pakistan a few years ago, for the longest time um, had adopted uh, all sorts of kind of horrific codified human rights practices, like a common list of terrorists, extremists, and separatists, um, with no clear designations for listing or delisting. The list group was sort of 15 organizations to 50, thousands of people, mostly political dissidents. And it was like classic uh, uh, log rolling, like, yeah, you designate your political dissident as a terrorist, and we'll designate ours, this kind of dynamic as well as allowing investigations and really legalized renditions to be conducted by security services. I mention all this because for the longest time, the EU and DC said, we're not going to engage with the SEO, right? It's just like, we're not going to give it the time of day. It's, 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 it's not something for us. And yet the SEO was becoming more and more influential. The Obama administration said, well, maybe we can engage with it on pragmatic grounds. Let's not talk about human rights and all this listing and stuff. Let's talk about Afghanistan because China and Russia have a joint interest in stabilizing Afghanistan. The problem with doing that, though, was it allowed these practices, which are against all of their human rights uh, commitments, to continue sort of unchallenged. I actually think a better form of engagement would be to engage both on Afghanistan and on the standards that they're using in their listing sort of practices. All this to say that this is sort of a similar dilemma, I think, that um, uh, the philanthropic community faces as well as the activist community. What do you do in situations where you know that your bets, which your uh, trustees uh, and Spotlight want uh, to pay off, they want you to have impact, aren't going to have impact in these authoritarian settings? Does that mean you withdraw and you just try and affect the middling countries? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, you know, there is a real... Um, um, you know, there's a real value in slowing down the boulder coming in, even though you know ultimately it's in a losing cause. So I just think that pragmatism itself, it, it, it has its cost, and particularly in a geopolitical moment, I think, where uh, uh, there is this sort of kind of broader backlash going on. Uh, but again, all this is like food for thought and what is a really robust and uh, really remarkable achievement. So thank you, Jack.
So Jack, one of the questions that arises from this entire exercise is when we talk about universal human rights, uh, some critics from other parts of the world would say that is imposing the values of Western hegemony. And as that changes on the world stage, will those values be reconsidered in other cultural contexts? So given this rich panoply of comments, uh, would you please offer your response? Yeah, the, uh, does a pragmatist actually have to uh, so, somehow change or water down uh, or localize the core values that are the, the target that you're aiming for uh, in uh, a program of promoting human rights? And I, I think on that one, uh, my views are similar to what I hear like regular human rights people saying, that there's some core human rights that are uh, basic for a couple of reasons. Um, they're non-derogable you know, rights that people just must have uh, because they're humans, but also they're um, crucial to making the whole system work this complex of liberalism, democracy, rights, rule of law. There's some things you just can't uh, you know, uh, put on the back burner because then the system functions not at all or backwards. Um, as far as localizing rights, um, again, I think the criterion is um, largely whether uh, setting aside uh, somewhat locally uh, uh, different uh, criteria for where they fall down on these conflicts of rights um, is something where um, the decisive point is if you let the locals um, get away with uh, calling human rights something that is its opposite, like torturing criminals in police custody in order to protect the human rights of the community, um, then, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's a, an adjustment that's going to just undermine the whole system of how human rights works with democracy and rule of law. Um, so I, I don't think I have differences with, like, typical human rights people uh, on, on that. But, um, so uh, let me uh, respond to just a, a, a few uh, major points of interest uh, from you know, each of the commentators. So uh, Arya Nair on shaming um, uh, and its central role for human rights. Um, when I presented uh, this chapter at Human Rights Watch, there was one part of it that was everybody's favorite, which was my discussion of what uh, the social psychology research says on the conditions under which shaming is effective. And they all started to take notes. Okay, here's when and how. <laughs> and uh, the, the you know, main bottom line there is Shaming from inside the group might work, especially if it's uh, shaming by a respected high status you know, source of the shaming. Shaming from outside the group rarely works unless uh, the people inside the group have a kind of aspirational position where they would like to be the, like the role models in the outside group, and they believe that the shaming is coming from a source that's highly respected and um, credibly known to be a friend of the group that's being shamed. Um, so, you know, to, to me, that sounds like a pretty strong limiting condition on when shaming is likely to be uh, effective. Um, I want to get very specific about shaming China over the treatment of the Uyghurs. 
Um, so there's been a lot of shaming done by everyone from the presidents of the United States to Human Rights Watch to you know students in classes at Columbia. And so I think that message has like gotten across to anyone who's within listening distance. Um, I think maybe now it's time to adjust the the political focus of that issue in a slightly different way. So um, one of the things that the Chinese are doing to the Uyghurs, they're doing to them uh, as exploited laborers, uh, slave laborers, uh, underpaid laborers, laborers that are kept in horrible living conditions, and so forth. Gee, you could make the same sort of criticism to many, many, many workers in China. And uh, so why not put the uh, rhetoric on something that puts the human rights uh, documenting and denouncing industry on the side of the vast majority of Chinese people whether they're Uyghurs or Han, Tibetans or, or whatever. And if, if to make that message credible, you need to dial down the uh, genocide talk a little bit so that your message is not just going to be automatically screened out as coming from a hostile enemy that wants to destroy our civilization. I think that would be uh, a big, a big plus. Um, oh, one other quick point: great example of Polish solidarity as one of the foundational movements of those great early days of the human rights movement. Um, solidarity was a you know domestic movement of you know Polish workers, and and you know there was a human rights climate in the West that you know, was no doubt a facilitator to it. But, but I think there's a lesson in uh, the impact of solidarity precisely because it was uh, indigenous, uh, a matter of national pride uh, and efficacy. Uh, Sherry, um, I love your point about, you know, what if Gorbachev had been um, trying to reform the Soviet Union uh, like 30 years uh, prior. Can I address and, that issue? Oh, yeah, go ahead, sure. Well, precisely the point that I made was that the human rights effort dealing with the Soviet Union had created a context, and Gorbachev was able to be effective because that context had been created. If that context had not been created by human rights pressure, uh, on the Soviet Union. I can't imagine that a Gorbachev would have become the leader of the country and would have engaged in the uh, efforts in which he engaged. That's the role of the human rights movement. That's one of the roles. So, okay, so sticking with Gorbachev, uh, Sherry's question about, well, what if Gorbachev had been at an earlier time? And actually, there was a central committee plenum where Gorbachev was trying to explain the theory behind uh, his uh, perestroika strategy and uh, that, that uh, addressed exactly this question. And he said, all of our economic institutions, including our political institutions, were developed by Stalin in the context of the five-year plans for the, the coercive uh, command economy development of uh, primitive capital accumulation. And those institutions and that way of doing things actually worked in the earliest phase of industrialization, which Gorbachev following like Western literature on this topic called the phase of extensive development where you're taking underutilized resources and workers and forcing them to work. And, uh, but 
Gorbachev said, s explained that, well, we're now in a completely different uh, position because we, we can't do any extensive development anymore. Everybody already is working and we've, you know, we're getting all our resources in play. Now we need intensive development, which can only be through the development of uh, rule of law, uh, economic uh, markets with free exchange and property rights and so on and so forth, democracy, free speech. And uh, he's exactly right. He was describing what happens to every country when they hit the middle income trap and they need to have this massive institutional shift. Only in the case of the Soviet Union, it was like a ginormous institutional shift because of how distorted their institutions were um, in, uh, in place. And so my chapter on China uses basically this theory, same theory that Gorbachev used to uh, talk about the need for the development of uh, liberal rights uh, okay, uh, the um, sequencing, I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about corruption uh, riffing off of your sequencing point because one of, uh, one of the parts of the book that I found particularly interesting to try to figure out was uh, how sequencing would help you uh, solve problems of corruption and build a kind of rights institutions that would deal with corruption. In fact, just a couple of days ago, I stumbled on an article uh, in my inbox that talked about the corruption paradox that, okay, here are the reforms that you need to adopt in order to stop corruption. But, oh, in all countries that are corrupt, uh, the people that would have the power to introduce those reforms are themselves the main sources of corruption, so that's why you can't ever do anything. Uh, but um, uh, Dr. Munju Papidi, uh, who's like, as far as I can tell, the, the world's anti-corruption documenter and uh, analyst, she has uh, a sequencing argument uh, of how to break down corruption and like get some get a crack in the corruption paradox and so that you can get some leverage on it and she focuses on forming a political coalition among the people in society who are losing out from corruption and often these are the uh, best educated people in the country, the people who are potentially most productive, but who are getting rep ripped off by uh, you know, crony politics of the older elites and the, the political uh, bosses. Um, and so this can be a coalition of uh, different professions, different types of business, different regions of the country that you know, are more productive but are paying the bill for the corrupt, uh, 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 more in power regions of the country. And uh, so that's partly collecting that coalition and partly uh, having uh, targeted gradual institutional reforms, which, um, and, and this I'm getting from an article on uh, reform politics in Vietnam, where the reform coalition uh, makes deals for side payments with some of the unreformed but poor regions, where they can just get paid off for their support in central decision making for institutional changes that make it possible for the reformists to uh, you know, get some traction, have more FDI, have a bit more rule of law, but without changing everything because they need the, the corrupt uh, allies that they have, just like the FDR needed Jim Crow in order to pass the New Deal. It's the same uh, kind of idea. And so it's a, it's a sequencing solution to what looked at from afar is just 
in, in unsolvable uh, paradox. Um, the, uh, on uh, Alex's uh, point about uh, corruption and the, the importance of worldwide systemic corruption as an enabler of corruption in um, uh, you know, many countries of the world, uh, one important thing to remember is this reforming <coughs> the international <coughs> systemic sources of global corruption <coughs> first is uh, not only smart because that really is, you know, a major source <coughs> of the problem, but it's also great public relations because you don't get then backlash to saying, oh, it's, it's those imperialists of the first world who are so high and haughty with their <coughs> liberalism that have their list of corruption, and their li the, the list of con uh, corruption is always names of countries and which ones are most corrupt, that forgets the fact that it's systemic. And so if your anti-corruption campaign focuses first on reforming the global system, which is, after all, sustained and run by you-know-who, people right down there. <laughs> uh, that's uh, a great public relations strategy for avoiding backlash, even while going after corruption uh, really hard. Uh, OK, I'm going to throw uh, Alex's closing question, like, out to the room, <laughs> because everybody can like address that question, I think. Thank you, Jack. Um, Ari is going to have a quick comment, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. And those who are following online can put their questions in the chat. Thanks. Um, I'm fairly sympathetic to the idea of linking um, uh, efforts to deal with corruption to efforts to um, uh, promoting human rights. And uh, I say that because um, it's very often the case that the um, uh, motive for um, significant human rights abuses uh, in various countries uh, is to head off um, exposure uh, or prosecution uh, for corruption. Uh, if you take uh, two examples, um, one is the uh, regime of uh, President Erdogan in Turkey, and the other is the regime of uh, Viktor Orban uh, in Hungary. Uh, these are extremely uh, corrupt uh, regimes. Um, the two um, institutions that pose a threat uh, to corrupt rulers uh, are uh, in civil law countries, uh, the judiciary, uh, and the press. Uh, that is, uh, in civil law countries, um, it is the judiciary that uh, initiates uh, prosecutions. And um, prosecutions for corruption uh, would uh, greatly threaten uh, Orban or greatly threaten uh, Erdogan. Um, but by uh, achieving control over the ju judiciary, uh, they can make sure uh, that uh, those prosecutions do not take place. Uh, and the press uh, can expose uh, corruption. And therefore, controlling the press uh, becomes uh, very important. And if you look at the uh, repression in both uh, Turkey and Hungary, uh, the foremost examples uh, of the repression uh, involve uh, the judiciary uh, and the, uh, the press. Um, so th because of that very close relationship, I think it's um, uh, something worth uh, considering. Um, uh, the other point I want to make is that the, these ideas about um, middle-income countries and um, uh, you know, don't, don't uh, persuade me uh, uh, significantly. Uh, a country that was a democracy uh, is India. Um, India um, has not made as much economic progress as China, uh, 
But India has made uh, a great deal of economic progress. There are many more middle-income uh, people in India uh, today uh, than there were uh, previously. Uh, and that has continued uh, under uh, Prime Minister Modi. Uh, but under Modi, uh, repression has greatly increased in India. Uh, repression against uh, minorities, against uh, Muslims, uh, against Sikhs, against uh, Christians, uh, has uh, increased immensely in India. And so here is uh, what is regularly referred to as the world's largest democracy, uh, which is getting closer to being a middle-income country uh, and where uh, repression has increased. If you go back historically, uh, think of Nazi Germany. Um, uh, Germany in the Weimar Republic was a democracy. Uh, Germany, by the standards of that era, was a middle-income country. And nevertheless, the Nazis were able to take power and uh, achieve the ultimate uh, in repression. So I, I wouldn't uh, put too much stock in this notion uh, that one is going to, uh, to achieve uh, a uh, liberal society um, by, um, uh, the, by economic development uh, and uh, by the fact that it once was a democracy. Democracies uh, grow sour. One of the, um, uh, the terrible phenomena of our era uh, is that most of the countries that have become um, uh, extremely repressive in our era are countries that in varying degree had become uh, democratic uh, and where uh, it is uh, those who came to power by de democratic means, uh, like Putin in Russia uh, and uh, Duterte in uh, the Philippines um, and uh, many others uh, who have uh, turned out to be extremely repressive. Yeah, uh, we could do an entire next panel and perhaps another book on the erosion of democracy, which will probably be an, of increasing importance in the time to come. Uh, questions from the audience, and if you could identify yourself and also specify whether you're addressing your question to one of the panelists. Um, you're in back here. Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Bat. I'm a current second year student at SIPA. Um, and I would love to address the author, uh, Jack Snyder. I Providing some context, I'm originally from Myanmar. I was part of the resistance movement there, and it was only because I had an opportunity to come to SIPA that I was able to escape my country. Um, particularly, I want to kind of address this idea that uh, unless we understand the context in which we operate in, our human rights movements are often doomed to fail. Um, you know, I sometimes think I'm the complete opposite of a pragmatist because our revolution, at least, was run on idealism and this idea that we could combat the military junta with whatever resources we had. Um, but it does feel that the international system has failed my country and many others in respect to the fact that there, the politics of empathy and care, particularly for post-colonial countries, um, I think is a huge trend that I'm seeing, kind of this lack of empathy and care uh, or the motivation to intervene in these contexts. Um, I suppose for me and a lot of our diaspora who are experiencing uh, human rights violation, uh, who come from countries that are experiencing human rights violations. Um, from your perspective then, what can be done or what should be done in order to support these movements that are largely within contexts that, as your book even states, are sometimes just too difficult for the international system to comprehend or even want to intervene in? Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, reminding me of what was uh, one of the most inspirational uh, moments that I experienced in doing this research. I was uh, in Yangon, uh, standing in a long, long line of hundreds of thousands of people on that one day of the year when people are allowed to go to the mausoleum to pay homage to uh, General An Song, the George Washington of uh, Burma, who's, you know, uh, uh, An Song Suu Kyi's uh, father. And uh, it, was a, it was a great event. It was like people from every civil society group, uh, the, like the neighborhoods, uh, 
uh, or labor unions and people who were there with their kids. And the path was lined with uh, the uh, Myanmar military with their you know, automatic guns. Uh, but it was, of course, monsoon, so it was raining. So they were there with like pink and purple flowered umbrellas that like who gave them those? I wasn't sure. But it was really uh, like a wonderful kind of uplifting moment to see people out peacefully expressing their uh, political convictions and having a good time. And uh, so, the, the problem was, uh, I mean, one of the problems in, in Myanmar is, you know, if you had made a checklist of the things that would make uh, consolidation of, uh, of democracy and social peace uh, in a multi-ethnic state uh, very difficult, if not impossible, you know, Myanmar would check off almost all of them. And um, I, th I think that, you know, just the first thing to say is this was a very hard case. But the second thing to say is that I think there was a kind of moment of naive euphoria uh, about the uh, Burmese um, progressive movement and uh, on Song Suu Kyi's uh, supporters. I mean, they did accomplish a, a lot. The, the uh, appeal uh, to uh, a bunch of the ethnic groups who actually voted for uh, Suu Kyi and the you know, Democratic Party, uh, that, that was very impressive. I got the feeling that people in the outside world uh, were like a, in a, having a little buzz of dizziness with success for a few years, not anticipating how hard this was going to have to be, and uh, what kinds of combination of uh, pressures, inducements uh, would have to be put on the table to prevent things from happening, like like did with the Rohingya. So uh, you know, I don't have a solution uh, for for that. You know, even <coughs> retrospectively, but uh, more awareness of what a hard case really looks like, and what are the political uh, practicalities that you need to deal with, um, is something that you know our students at SEPA should think hard about. And, and I'd like to add that that's part of the great value of SEPA, that we have students like you who can bring their experience to the, to the classroom and to the community. Um, uh, yes, uh, Dirk? Yeah, you've been talking uh, nearly only about individual rights. When you go back to the Universal Declaration, there's a whole second part about economic and social rights. The right to food, the right to uh, roof over your head. Uh, to clean water. And that package has been the agenda for a whole group of pragmatists who call themselves the development and humanitarian community. The right to food gives us the World Food Program, the right to housing, new and habitats. Um, humanitarians dramatically are driven by the analysis of what people lack in terms of rights and implement them in a pragmatic manner. Um, and are those collective rights really secondary to individual rights? Or do you go with the German poet Brecht who says, uh, a full belly is a precondition to uh, morals? Um, where do you, how do, does a new model, that whole collective component, fit into the broader picture? Uh, yeah, so I come down you know, very strongly in the book in favor of paying a lot of attention to economic rights and to the economic grievances of people all over the world, which includes grievances over inequality, um, grievances over corruption. Uh, and, you know, one motivation for, for 
making that an even higher priority uh, as an uh, as a f like focus for organizing, uh, including organizing mass movements, is that this is a way for the human rights movement to be popular with what it calls its greatest power, the grassroots of civil society worldwide. But I have a quote in the book from Ken Roth who says, well, unfortunately, at this stage in the development of the human rights movement, we actually don't have the capacity to really mobilize a mass social movement. And uh, so why is that? Because human rights um, top tier organizations have uh, not placed as much um, priority on these kinds of economic grievances as they could if they were looking for issues that would have really strong re resonance you know, out there in what they claim to be their constituency and their uh, source of power. As to uh, individual rights versus collective rights, um, the theory underpinning my book is that, as Sherry laid out very nicely, is that the transformation from traditional society to a, a liberal modern order is one uh, that's a transition from um, uh, in-group favoritism, nepotism, uh, and uh, patron client systems where there's um, uh, an ascriptive criterion for who you're going to help and who you're going to cheat uh, or exclude. And that uh, the modernization in a liberal direction uh, has to work by tearing down uh, those, uh, fav those kinds of favoritisms uh, and corruption and patronage, and it has to move towards individual rights where there's equality uh, uh, before the law and uh, where individuals can go to, to court. Uh, to, they don't have to go with their 27 cousins to back them up from the whole tribe. And uh, so the, the theory of the book is uh, sometimes you have to have a political strategy that aligns with um, uh, collective groups of people, including ethnic groups or religions and so forth, but that over the long arc, what you want to do is, whenever possible, make the choice of strategy to go in the individual rights, equality before the law, uh, impersonal social relations rather than social relations of favoritism uh, for in-group members. Uh, yes, Yen. Uh, I have a question. Uh, my name is Zainab. I'm an MBA DB from the Bachelor's second year. Um, I know you mentioned about like toning down for like um, not like public issues, kind of more of, like with the language of genocide and all this thing. Um, I agree the genocide war is a huge thing when we call country that's committing a genocide. Um, but I feel accountability is something missing um, when it comes to human rights. And one of the things is in the US, we take pride of like, taking leads with human rights issues and all this thing. But also, the US has a hand on um, committing human rights violations, especially by feeding in weapons with the war that's happening in Yemen by sending weapons uh, to Saudi Arabia, not holding Saudi Arabia accountable, especially with so many crimes that's happening. Also, we don't talk about the Israeli crimes against Palestinians, and knowing that um, uh, an American journalist was killed, and still the US did not make um, a, a, a public accountability on what that means for us. And I feel like accountability is a very important thing when we talk about human rights, and I'm wondering <coughs> Are you addressing that in your book about accountability and being courageous? Because, um, it's it's tough topic to talk, and I feel like um, being courageous 
Uh, yeah, the chapter in the book that, you know, does the most relentless finger-wagging at uh, U.S.-based entities is the one on media freedom and the need for regulating uh, media, including social media worldwide, and that's, you know, largely uh, a crisis that's been caused by actors in, in the U.S. Um, the... Um, the book otherwise, you know, misses a lot of opportunities to finger wag at the U.S. for like horrible things like uh, the policy in the Yemen uh, civil war, which uh, you know maybe got worse under Trump, but was not only something that we can blame on Trump. So uh, um, I, the the point is uh, though. Uh, not just to uh, shame and denounce like individual perpetrators, but to change the system. And one of our uh, PhD graduates from uh, political science department in Columbia, Colin Call, has uh, just over the last few weeks, uh, you know, announced uh, a new kind of review of past abuses of certain kinds done uh, by the U.S. Pentagon. Um, and not with the idea like, of putting like, individuals on trial or, or, uh, uh, or punishing them, but with the idea of changing the standard operating <coughs> procedures of the U.S. military uh, so that things like that uh, don't just happen routinely by the the way things are mindlessly done. So it's, I mean, generally speaking, my rule of thumb is that if you want to fix any ill, whether it's corruption or atrocities, um, the solution is not to punish the individuals who are doing it necessarily, although you might want to uh, do that too, but the, the thing that really makes the difference is change the system that produced the potential for that behavior. Uh, we have a question from our online audience. Yes, I actually have a question for myself and then I will ask the question on the audience, taking advantage of my position here. One of the largest challenges to local-led, non-interventionist approaches to countering human rights activism is the activities of repressive or genocidal states with power beyond what can be mobilized locally. As we've seen in Germany, North Korea, and Rwanda, delays and failure to act on an international scale has led to disastrous results, but we are also seeing native, local-led human rights movements in areas where the U.S. and its allies are not, Iran. What can we do as the international community to support and foster local human rights movements in other closed states without having those movements villainized as being planted by the U.S. or its allies? And then I'll read the second question. <laughs> and you're directing this to? Well, you're the expert on the local-led, I guess, side of things, but happy to hear. Yeah, I'll, I'll just throw out a, a quick reaction to that in the hopes that uh, uh, others will pick on, up on it. Um, so, I, uh, with my research assistant, the one who's the idealist, um, I looked at the list of um, uh, protests in the whole world, like for the last umpteen years, and uh, we found that like roughly a third of the protests were on the subject of corruption. And almost all of the, those protests were initiated by some local anti-corruption ad hoc group. Um, so what role did uh, global human rights top tier organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty play in those? Generally, they would either not join in at all, uh, or if they did join in, they would join in to protest against government repression of freedom of assembly and freedom of speech. Um, 
which I assume was because th it, they thought that it put them on like a, a much firmer, like kind of legal, mainstream human rights um, footing for for uh, calling out the the government, um, and uh, so you know the. I mean, if I we, add we, yeah. We, so in the in the in the book, we just raise the question: Is that smart strategy, or should you know some other way of uh, promoting these kinds of uh, efforts locally be be developed? Um, an organization such as Human Rights Watch puts the protection of local human rights activists uh, at the top of its agenda. Uh, it uh, tries to make sure uh, that any attack upon uh, a human rights activist is uh, noted and becomes the subject of uh, international efforts uh, to protect the person uh, in um, extreme circumstances. Um, helping people to get out of the country or uh, f finding some way for physical protection uh, also becomes uh, a, um, uh, a, a role of the human rights movement. There are specialized um, human rights organizations uh, which um, exclusively devote themselves to that. So, for example, um, the leading group in that area is an Irish uh, organization, uh, Defenders of, of Human Rights. And uh, the uh, woman who was the um, uh, creator of that organization, a woman named Mary Lawler, is today the uh, UN rapporteur on the protection of uh, human rights defenders. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that being uh, someone who has worked in this area back into the early 1980s, uh, my recollection is that working with local groups was always a, a central concern, and yes. you would find these relationships becoming very close uh, in terms of them having a physical presence in the offices uh, in New York and London, and vice versa. Um, and, and the other thing I, I wanted to note is that a lot of times the human rights defense in countries are not a matter of mass movements. They're a matter of people with a certain level of education and influence taking it upon themselves to assume leadership positions, which then make them vulnerable. Um, if you get to the point of mass movements and massive protests and so on, uh, it's just all too easy for the repressors to take violent measures against them. So the battlefield is not always what is most visible to the outside world. Um, you had another question from the online audience? Yes, uh, Sun Min Rai is asking, uh, Jack Snyder states that shaming is unhelpful to convince an authoritarian elite to change their behavior, but isn't public naming and shaming also a tactic of convincing allies and the rest of the international community to act? to get donors to fund interventions, whether or not that be a peacekeeping operation or a humanitarian mission or just additional support on the ground? And isn't that public declaration to reach others who might not be paying attention necessary to motivate individuals to act? Uh, yeah, I think that one of the things that uh, shaming um, denunciation strategies have succeeded tremendously at is kind of mobilizing a global cadre, especially in the global north, of people who uh, are outraged at what's going on, know about it, uh, have like very powerful emotions about it, and are willing to uh, you know, sign up for this as their career, or if not that, uh, send a donation. So it's, you know, it's been a gr uh, sh shaming and um, universalism have been like really good ways to build the human rights movement. Um, whether they are effective at, you know, shaming the perpetrators is, uh, another question, uh, 
third parties, there's actually really interesting uh, work that's being done more on how third parties respond to uh, human rights criticism of a perpetrator uh, country and how the perpetrator country plays the game of responding to this criticism. Um, and often the, uh, the third party onlookers don't really care very much about the human rights uh, situation in the country. Um, but, you know, if, if, the, if there's no fig leaf, then they're going to feel compelled to do uh, politically awkward and maybe costly condemnation of the country. But if the country, like, puts up a good show and has a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that issues a report and said, oh, no, the military didn't do anything that was bad, then those kinds of countries will say, well, uh, you know, people have views on both sides of this question, and uh, we've been reading the documentation, but uh, meanwhile, we're going to continue with our billion dollar trade deal with Sri Lanka or whatever it is. So um, that's, a, I think, a, a good uh, you know, issue area right now for more research on how this works. Uh, so once we figure out like how, how this works, then we'll know what the countermeasures are to, to deal with this uh, quasi-compliance for uh, an unmotivated audience. More questions? Uh, yes, in the back, please, standing up. Thank you. Uh, yes, Minerga. Jack, I want to first of all thank you for a great, really great contribution to human rights analysis and human rights studies. It seems to me, though, that when you've been speaking um, today, you've said two slightly different things. And at times you've said it's the entire system. When you are up against systemic human rights abuses, it's the system that needs to change. But the thrust of the, pragm of the pragmatism analysis, if I've understood it correctly, is that systemic change is precisely what the human rights movement can't really produce. That, human, that pragmatic human rights activists operate within a relatively narrow bandwidth, which is that which enables them to decide or to figure out how much dissidence they can express forcefully from what is the prevailing system in order to push it a little bit more, but unless the, pre the systemic preconditions for that pushing to be successful already exist, the human rights objectives can't really be reached. And as I hear the debate, I think the debate between you and Arya Nair, and it's a great honor to have the whole panel but to be uh, listening to, for, uh, to Arya's reconstruction of the human rights movement is precisely that the human rights mobilizations created the preconditions or were part of the creation of the preconditions for the systemic change that then allowed at least some of the human rights aspirations to be realized, however, temporarily. And so that's the tension as I see it. And you know, I myself am stuck between saying, aspire for what you can get through the allies whom you can find, and no, your job is to push forward and something will happen later. And I'm just can, can I just amend that for a moment? Um, the, uh, the human rights movement does not primarily focus on achieving uh, geopolitical change. Uh, its main focus is on mitigating <coughs> abuses. It doesn't necessarily uh, think that it's going to transform uh, any country in which it works, but it wants to reduce the number of political imprisonments. It wants to reduce the number of torture cases. 
the number of forcible exile cases and, and so forth. And if it can achieve that, uh, it feels that uh, it has accomplished something significant. If it can bring about um, or help bring about, because there are always multiple factors involved, but if it can help bring about a um, change in regime uh, that is more sympathetic to human rights, that's wonderful. Uh, but it's not its, uh, its main goal. Uh, its, go its, its main goal is the mitigation of abuses. And, and I think that that uh, leads to a point that's been somewhat missing in this conversation, which is that the human rights movement can't expect to transform societies in every way. And it works within a constellation of different movements that include economic development, that include people struggling with the concept of democratization. Um, and, and so I, I think it, uh, all of these movements or organizations have the danger of mission creep, but they're each the most effective when, when they focus and on, on what they're able to do and develop techniques to address those needs. So, you know, an awful lot of the human rights organizations spend time in virtual rescue operations in order to enable the people in the country to do their jobs in terms of promoting systemic changes and human rights protocols. Uh, another question? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, first of all, I thought it was, uh, it's, been a real, it's been a phenomenal panel, actually. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and it's really, um, we've, we've been scribbling notes, um, which I, I don't always do on human rights panels, so thank you. That's really, and, and the part. Um, I guess just two short, one short comment and, and one short question. I thought Alex's question about, um, you know, so from a practical level, what do you do with your foundation? And is there, is there an argument to be made for just sort of slowing it down? But I, I guess one of my reactions to it in light of your work and, and, and Jack's work, which is not saying that both in different ways get this backlash question, is isn't the concern that you express in your work that, you, that by doing that work you're triggering something that comes at you much faster? So you know, how, do you, how do you differentiate between the foundations continue to invest in these situations and slow things down as opposed to being tarnished, in, which I, you know, I think both of you can always get at in your work. So it's not just, it's not always, when can you slow it down and when do you trigger it? Um, and I guess, Jack, your, your argument, your answer to, I've forgotten who it was, about China is fascinating. Um, but, you know, if rather than focusing on the Uyghurs, one focuses on labor and labor rights and the conditions of which, you know, many people across China have that have dog in that fight. It, you know, it's sort of like some of the battles that people have fought at the WTO or elsewhere. And they haven't really been very successful. So, I mean, what, where is your cause for optimism and success with this alternative strategy that you're um, proposing for dealing with rights issues in China? Uh, so, should we be slowing things down because we're pushing too hard on, and, and provoking resistance from the people who fear uh, color revolutions. Uh, well, slowing what down? Um, slowing the research on abuses down? Definitely not. Uh, slowing down the throwing around of words like genocide and pariah when you have absolutely no follow-up plan for how you're going to use those accusations to get the perpetrator over a barrel. Uh, so I don't mind, you know, if people occasionally use the, the genocide or pariah words, but to have like a, a drumbeat of that dominating uh, the relationship, uh, when there's no political strategy to use it to some like real end, you know, then that should be slowed down so that there's space to engage in structure attempts at structural change. So yeah. another By one where, way, where, uh, where human where rights I, watch never never use the word genocide with respect to the Uyghurs. 
That was used by the United States government. Um, Anthony Blinken um, uh, used the word genocide. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, that's, that's part of the problem, I think. I, I think uh, Human Rights Watch has used the term genocide um, maybe three times uh, in its entire history. It used it with respect to Rwanda. Uh, it used it with respect to the um, uh, Iraqi Kurds killed by Saddam Hussein in the Anfal. Uh, and uh, it didn't, it, uh, with respect to Bosnia, it used the word genocidal uh, in terms of some of uh, the uh, attacks, such as uh, Srebrenica. Um, uh, but um, I think those are the only occasions in its um, uh, 43 year history, 43 year history, that it has used the word genocide. Admirable restraint. One of the things that I did for the book was I uh, just checked pretty much at random 10 Human Rights Watch reports um, uh, on you know, current human rights problems in various places in the world with the, the question, uh, again, this was my uh, uh, idealistic research assistant that, that helped with this. Well, the, the question was, well, like how bad was the shaming really in these reports? And uh, you know what we found was that in every case the reports were like immaculately researched and accurate, and and the fa the, the factual basis was appeared to us to be completely solid. Um, that um, a, a lot of the the uh, discussion was. Uh, just describing abuses, pointing out you know where they were against the the law and so forth, uh, and a lot of it was uh, just recommendations for things that should happen so that uh, abuses wouldn't. And so like a lot of that was fine, but for a pretty significant proportion of the reports, uh, we found that there were things in them that. Uh, used highly charged language, uh, sometimes quoted from a local rather than in the voice of the, the writer, uh, that in, in our judgment included um, language that seemed to uh, stigmatize something about the nature of uh, not just the perpetrator, but the society. And um, so the, like the one on the Polish priests that were, quote, demonizing uh, women who uh, had had abortions or advocated uh, for abortions, I, you, know, you know, probably so. It's not that what they said was wrong, but they said it, in, it with you know, like hot-blooded language and uh, it aimed at a hot-blooded issue that dealt with an identity characteristic of the local culture. Uh, so, you know, a lot of them were not as bad as, you know, as notable as that one, but uh, it seemed to me that if, if the definition of shaming uh, includes an accusation, not only that a wrong was done, but that indicated that uh, not only the perpetrator, but something about the culture of the society was deeply flawed in one of its main practices or institutions. I, I, I chapter and that this on is, that. Yeah, um, it's in there. It's in there with quotes. <laughs> so we have come to the end of our time. We could gladly debate another two hours, but join me in applause for everyone.